Thank you. Could I ask our guests in the gallery uh, who are leaving the chamber to please do so uh, quickly and quietly, uh, because we are now going back into session to continue with our business. Thank you very much for your cooperation. And the next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 12369 in the name of Fulton McGregor on fostering a discussion on a kindergarten stage in Scotland. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would invite those members who are wishing to speak in the debate to please press the crisis beat buttons and I call on Fulton McGregor to open the debate. Around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And firstly, I would like to thank all members who have supported my motion, which calls for a discussion on a kindergarten stage in Scotland. And I'd also like to pay particular thanks to my colleague, Colcab Stewart, for um, initially leading up the discussion on this issue before, of course, she was promoted to government. Presiding officer, the tendency for children to start formal education at four or five years old means that Scotland, and indeed the wider UK for that matter, is currently an outlier across Europe. Our tradition of starting at school at this age was enshrined with the Education Scotland Act in 1872. And although this piece of legislation was groundbreaking at the time for ensuring that every child got an education, a century, a century and a half of research and improved understanding of child psychology and development has meant that this is now a very archaic mindset that we have today. And looking across Europe, delaying starting academic studies is becoming more and more widespread with many countries opting for their children to start school at six or even seven years old. And change in this sort of area is possible. In Scotland today, the deferment of a four-year-old child is now the decision of the parent or legal guardian, thanks to the tireless work of the Give Them Time campaign. Their campaign for a further year of nursery funding for all children who defer their primary one start in Scotland was a resounding success and reflects the change in attitudes that we are seeing today in Scotland with regards to school starting ages. And I want to put on record again eh, my thanks eh, to all those involved in that campaign, and I know that they eh, support the kindergarten model as well. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, Megan Gallagher. I absolutely echo everything that Fulton McGregor has just said, and would he agree with me that Diane Delaney is an absolute trailblazer when it comes to campaigning and highlighting these particular issues? Fulton McGregor. I thank uh, the member for that intervention and would completely agree with her. Diane is a constituent of mine and, and Megan's, and she certainly is that. Um, President officer, at its most basic level, a kindergarten stage is a stage whereby the emphasis of a child's education focuses more on opportunities for children to play. It is a way in which children can learn through enjoyable experiences rather than formal teaching. It is underpinned by the development of social and communication skills teacher-led opportunities for art, drama, music, science, maths, investigations and listening to stories. The benefits of such a stage are self-evident. Physically, it promotes physical self-confidence and bodily control. Mentally, it allows children's creativity to flourish, as well as helping them develop self-control and problem-solving. Socially, it provides a perfect opportunity for children to progress their interpersonal skills, such as communication, empathy and teamwork. Cognitively, play-based learning can improve a child's innate understanding of mathematical and scientific concepts. A kindergarten stage would not be free time for the children to do as they please. Rather, it would be an educational approach that supports their all-round physical, emotional, social and cognitive development, not just their academic development. Another key component of this play-based approach is access to the outdoors and increased contact with the natural world. Today, less and less of our children spend time outdoors. It is no surprise that instead they often stay inside, more likely to be watching TV or engaging with their ever-increasing digital world. And anybody who is a parent like myself knows exactly what that it looks like. With outdoor play being such an important part of kindergartens globally, a kindergarten stage could give all Scottish children time and space to develop the habits of outdoor play that promote mental and physical health and wellbeing. For those that fear that focusing on these aspects will inhibit academic achievement, a large body of research has found the opposite to be the case. In fact, promoting physical, emotional, social and cognitive development has been shown to promote and complement academic achievement. In essence, a kindergarten stage can give children the tools to cope with the, rigorous, the rigors of academic stresses, rather than throwing them in, throwing them in the deep end when they are just four or five years old. I have spoken a lot about the hypothetical benefits, but to present some facts, ever since 
PISA comparisons began, it might be a surprise to some to learn that countries with an early school starting age have not performed as well as those where formal education starts later. 66% of countries worldwide start at age 6, 22% at age 7 and only 12% at age 4 or 5. Last year, the best performing countries were China, Singapore, Estonia, Japan, South Korea, Canada, Taiwan, Finland, Poland and Ireland. Of these, four have a school starting age of seven, China, Estonia, Finland and Poland, and for the rest, they start school at six, so none at five. UNICEF surveys of, of children's wellbeing has also continually, sh continually shown a correlation between countries with later school starting ages and improvements in children's wellbeing. In looking at the campaign to foster a discussion on this kindergarten stage in Scotland, a particular credit must lie with Upstart Scotland, who have representatives joining us in the gallery this afternoon, although I'm not sure if they're in yet, presiding officer. The Upstart have made it their mission to promote and advocate for a kindergarten stage to be introduced in Scotland. Their website is full of invaluable information, academic sources and holistic discourse supporting the advancement of this play-based stage to be considered here in Scotland. The conversation around this topic, and that, I think that might be upstart uh, representatives coming in just now. The, convers <laughs> the conversation around this topic is indeed growing. Last month I hosted a roundtable which brought together Scottish education stakeholders and a group of Norwegian kindergarten practitioners. The roundtable concentrated in a discussion on the differing education systems of Norway and Scotland, with particular focus on the Norwegian kindergarten system. The Norwegian kindergarten staff work in a small private kindergarten with 20 children. Their focus areas were farming, food production and outdoor living, as well as other areas of learning. And it was eye-opening to see how beneficial this op opportunity was for the Norwegian children, especially in showing how this stage empowers children in so many ways at such an early age. Most strikingly, perhaps, is the evidence that a later formal school setting can help close the attainment gap. We know that it is a key goal of the Scottish Government to close the poverty-related attainment gap. It would be presumptuous to assume that changing educational policy could close this gap alone, but a play-based stage for all across Scotland has the power to level the playing field and provide those children from impoverished backgrounds with the same sorts of experience and support as those in more advantaged circumstances. To put it bluntly, when children are expected to make the transition from a nursery setting to a formal school environment with an emphasis on literacy and numeracy at a time when they are only halfway through their early years, disadvantaged children are put at an even further disadvantage to catch up in terms of problem solving and language development. I would say, presiding officer, that I know that, and the minister might come to this, that some schools are certainly doing a play-based approach in primary one. I know, for example, the school that my uh, children go to uh, now, now does that, didn't for my older child, but does uh, for, for, my, uh, for my middle child. Um, so, but it's, it's, I think the point is that it's not consistent enough, even within local authorities, uh, never mind across the country as a whole. Of course, there would be challenges in adopting this approach. Our current system of early years learning in our nursery sector would have to be revisited. There would be the obvious question of how we would deliver the additional training required for new and existing early year staff. And on this point, there has been encouraging developments with Play Scotland's work with the SQA on a play pedagogy qualification, which has just been recognised with accredited status. But in any national discussions that we have, it is necessary to have an assessment of the training needs, identifying where training will come from and who will deliver it, and a programme of costed implementation. Likewise, our current system of local authority provision, private, voluntary and independent childcare, and P1 and P2 years would have to would have to be coordinated to deliver this kindergarten stage. This coordination will, of course, also need to be financed. And while I do not deny this is a challenge, I firmly believe that it is a challenge that is well worth taking. I do not have the time to forensically budget for these costs today, but it is only about the beginning of this discussion. In conclusion, President Officer, Scotland is still quite set in its Victorian approach to formal learning. Although this discussion is in its early stages, we must seriously consider the range of benefits that introducing a kindergarten stage could bring to our children. I can understand why some may have reservations, but this is not a new idea. Countries that have introduced such a stage have seen hugely improved, well-rounded development of their children. I will continue to advocate on this, and I encourage all parties to de dedicate time to research the potential value of kindergartens in Scotland. And once again, I would like to thank Upstart Scotland and the numerous other stakeholders that have 
diligently and convincingly set out the arguments to modernise the Scottish education system and bring us into line with our European neighbours. I will close with an abridged quote from Sue Palmer, Upstart's Honorary President. No child should be in school at the age of five. The poverty-related attainment gap is at the root of developmental issue. By starting formal teaching too soon, we consolidate this gap. Too early introduction to formal learning. Mr. McGregor, anxiety, I have been very generous. You are now which, at nearly 10 minutes. Please which can conclude. affect one's mental health for life. I will leave it for the President Officer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McGregor. My clock is at 9.52. Just that one was not put on in error. Thank you. Um, we will now move to the open debate, and I would urge members to stick to their allotted time, which is, in fact, up to four minutes. And I call Bob Doris oh. to be followed by Ros McCall. Mr Doris. Oh. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, can I start by thanking Phil McGregor for the opportunity to debate uh, here th this afternoon? Uh, and I'm very pleased to speak in this debate, and I'm particularly keen to see a wider debate about whether to move to a kindergarten system and stage in Scotland, delaying the commencement of formal education in Scotland to perhaps six or even seven, as we have heard. As the motion states, such an approach is not uncommon internationally, and often those, those countries have higher attainment levels than our UK systems. And I can well see the advantage of an expanded and structured play-based system in Scotland. And Philip McGregor suggests that would be in relation to physical fitness and in relation to social skills and cognitive capacities more generally, putting building blocks for learning for the longer term, perhaps, and uh, people's personal uh, qualities being enhanced. But now, I tend to think of my own family, as you would do when you look at changes in the school system. And my son went to school at five. He could have went to school at four. He was certainly more than ready to go to school at five years old. I have to say, a, a, a superb nursery for my son, but he was ready to move on. And the question is, what does he move on to, is the question we have to ask ourselves. There are, of course, uh, play-based activities in primary one and onwards anyway, and perhaps that can be expanded and a hybrid system could be introduced within the early years of primary school rather than necessarily expanding early years sectors. Maybe a hybrid system is a possibility. I suppose it's my way of saying, presiding officer, uh, I'm willing to be convinced on a kindergarten stage, but surely that's what a conversation is all about. I want to know the interaction between core literacy and numeracy skills, numeracy skills and how they will be enhanced at that early stage as part of active play and structured learning and a different model of delivery compared to the current situation. Interestingly, at a recent parents' night, I was informed there would be a more structured and traditional approach to learning for my son when he enters primary four uh, uh, at the middle of, of August. So already we can see that schools and local authorities are seeking to innovate in primary one through to primary three, and they will continue to do so. I remember in primary one uh, that parents, including her family, I have to say, were asking why the kids didn't have pens or pencils in their hands and weren't doing lots of writing. And it was explained to us that working with young people in relation to garnering their emotions and interpersonal skills, their own self-worth, their own dignity, all those interactions are vitally important. And those are really good foundation building blocks for later in life and, importantly, for learning. So I suppose it's my way of saying that some of this, maybe only a wee bit, might be starting to evolve naturally in the innovation that primary schools are doing just now. But I'm willing to be convinced of a more dramatic shift. It's a fascinating idea. I think we would have to build a lot of faith with many parents who, like I was, were saying, where's my kid's jotter? Where's the pencil? Where's their homework? All those kind of things that we naturally come to expect. But I suppose if we are developing and innovating, we have to take parents and we have to take young people with us. But it's vitally important to have this conversation. As a dad, as much as an MSP, because we've got a wee girl who's three at the moment, I'm interested to know what that would look like for me and my family. But of course, all the families that I represent and I'm proud to represent in Maryhill and Springburn. And given the time constraints, President Officer, I'll leave it there. And I thank you, Fulton McGregor, for bringing this debate to Parliament this afternoon. Thank you, Mr Doris. I call Ros McCall to be followed by Martin Whitfield. Ms McCall. 
Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, I'd like to also start by thanking Fulton McGregor for bringing this discussion to the Chamber and continuing the work of CoCab Stewart. Uh, I also want to quickly mention my respect for the inclusion of his constituency, Cote Bridge and Chryston, in the motion. I'm going to be uh, a little bit open now. My gran was born and raised in Gart Sherry, <laughs> along with seven brothers and sisters, and after working with the Salvation Army in London, she returned back, and I hope Mr Fulton will forgive to the slight diversion, to a neighbouring constitu uh, constituency in Gara Hill. Um, my great-grandfather was the leader of Gart Sherry's Silver Band, although I wasn't old enough to hear him play, and my dad went to Cope Bridge High, so I've got an awful lot of fondness for the area he represents, but I digress. The motion this afternoon is regarding fostering a discussion on a kindergarten stage in Scotland. And that is a discussion I look forward to having. How, what model, implications, unintended or otherwise. I also commend Upstart Scotland and other organisations for the work they do to highlight an early years education that's based on creative play and social connection. You know, it's not actually surprising when you think about it. When I started working here a couple of years ago, the phone I was given was not one I'm used to. So I played with it for a while until I understood what the functions did. We are more likely to understand how things work by doing and trying than sitting reading the manual. It's human nature. How our brain functions in formative years should inform early years childcare our education and societal processes. The Centre for Developing the Child at Harvard University noted that when children have opportunities to develop executive function and self-regulation skills, individuals and society experiences lifelong benefits. These skills are crucial to learning and development and they also enable positive behaviour and allow us to make healthy choices. They also go on to say that providing the support that children need to build these skills at home, in early care and education programmes, and in other settings they experience regularly, is one of society's most important responsibilities. Growth-promoting environments provide children with scaffolding that helps them practice necessary skills before they must perform them alone. Now, understanding this process to developing cognitive function is imperative, as it has so many bearings on the issues within society that we are trying to address. And encompassing this within our early years education system will support all children, regardless of background. So if we are all of one mind, and so far I think we are, uh, we proceed in advancing the discussion on a kindergarten model for Scotland, it's essential that we do not minimise the options we research right out the gate. The Nordic models are regularly highlighted in discussions, indeed Upstart Scotland focused on the Finnish model, and a recent report from Parenting Across Scotland pushes a Swedish one. And that might just be the case if these fit in well with Scottish Anthropo. But we should not presume that a Singaporean model or a Canadian model would not work here in Scotland. Upstart Scotland themselves highlighted this very point in the website that equally um, Mr. Fulton has, um, Mr. McGregor, sorry, has already highlighted by saying in 2023 the best performing countries were, in descending order, China, Singapore, Estonia, Japan, South Korea, Canada, Taiwan, Finland, Poland and Ireland. And all of these have a starting school age of seven, China, Estonia, Finland um, and Poland, but the rest at six, sorry. So in conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, we should embrace this opportunity fully, but now is not the time to limit the scope of the discussion. We need to look around the world, not just across the water. Thank you. Thank you, Ms McCall. I now call Martin Whitfield to be followed by Ross Greer. Mr Whitfield. Um, I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer, and it is a pleasure to take part in what I think is perhaps one of the more fascinating members' debates that we've had the opportunity to do. And I, along with others, thank Fulton McGregor for um, bringing it towards the chamber today. We have an interesting discussion over a, a pedagogy, over a fixed asset, i.e. our current schooling system, and the needs of our individual children. And I, I think Bob Doris's comment about my child was ready to start school is one that a lot of parents will echo. Similarly, there are parents who recognise their child is not ready to start school. Um, and there is the option to extend that nursery year, as we've already discussed. 
The fascinating thing here is we are talking about that. Fulton McGregor. The, the member for taking that intervention. I, I suppose it's a, question, a point for himself as well as Bob Doris. Do you accept that it, this is not, it's not just about is your child being ready for school or not? Because I, I would say that both my children were ready, eh, that have went to school so far were ready for school at five, ready in inverted commas. But if we were to change the system altogether where you don't go to school at five, is it not better for society as a whole? And, and that's the point that's been made with all the other countries who are already, uh, you know, more than five. Martin Whitfield. I'm, I'm very grateful for that intervention. Actually, that speaks to the heart of, of what I'm going to talk about, because I think actually the way to look at this is to look at the young people um, themselves, from babies to young children and all the way through, because we can intellectually identify that initial play of a baby just thrashing around on a mat and movement as the sort of unoccupied play that happens through the sort of solitary play where a child doesn't want to be with anyone else except perhaps their mother or father, to that spectator where they stand there and they observe other children playing, to that parallel play where they sit down, often in a sand pit with their hands in, but they're playing themselves next to others through to the associate play where they want to start involving themselves and finally to that cooperative play which is very much at the foundation um, of what organisations and play pedagogy talks about because of all of the soft skills that a child then acquires, the ability not to argue with the child next to them because they've taken the piece of Lego, the ability to solve a problem because they want something on the other side of the table they can't reach, to be out in the forest and fall over a root branch and be helped up by one of their young comrades. These are all the very soft but essential skills that are required. And that's what sits at the heart of the United Nations rights of Article 30, 31 and Article 29. And I want to, to spend the short time that I have in particular about that. Because Article, Article 29 talks about education being directed to the development of a child's personality, their talents, their mental and physical abilities to their fullest potential and how we support that, how we scaffold that, how we provide the environment for that to happen in, is not one that is fixed by adults' decisions of at this age you do this, at this age you do that. It is about understanding the flexible needs. And mention's been made already of existing schools, particularly at P1 and P2, where play performs such an important element in that. But it has taken many years to move what sits, frankly, at the heart of the curriculum for excellence about the use of that play actually into the classrooms, if we want to use that phrase. And I visit schools and watch P1s with the most wonderful outdoor play areas. And when I talked about the fixed assets, I was talking about, and mention has been made of training, but we have wonderful early years workers, but of course they need support and training. It's also about the facilities and experiences that our young people and children have the opportunity to be in. Um, it is right to mention Charlotte Bowes and Play for P1 because the network of support that's there for practitioners is phenomenal. And I think in opening this discussion, I'm conscious of time, Deputy Presiding Officer, and to open this discussion is very important. But I think just to sit in a formulaic idea where we're going to replace the start of school at four or five with something else misses the opportunity to have a transitional experience for young people so they learn through play, not just up to eight, but off into adulthood, but they learn through it and they are ready to make the next steps supported by the communities around them. I'm grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr Whitfield. I now call Ross Greaves to be followed by Megan Gallagher. Mr Greaves. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and like colleagues, I'd like to congratulate Fulton McGregor for securing this debate and to thank Upstart Scotland, give them time, and everyone else who's campaigned for so long in this space. The Scottish Greens were proud to propose a kindergarten stage in our manifesto for the last election to this Parliament, and specifically we proposed a kindergarten stage between the ages of three and six and formal primary school starting at seven, which would bring Scotland into line with Finland and the number of other high-performing nations that Ros McCall mentioned a moment ago. I recognise that others would have a three to five kindergarten and school starting at six, and I think it is important to tease out that detail, but at this stage, I think the priority really is on the agreement in principle to move forward with this conversation, because I think there is a consensus emerging here. So why should we raise the starting age for formal primary school? 
think we should start off with recognising that the status quo here in Scotland and across the UK isn't correct just because that's how it's always been, as Fulton McGregor mentioned, how it's always been since the Victorian era. We are an international outlier, putting four and a half year olds into formal schooling. I want to start off by addressing one of what I think are the, the myths about these proposals. What we're not proposing, those of us who advocate for this, is delaying a child's education. What we believe is that that education would be better by delaying the start of formal primary school and establishing that kindergarten stage. A couple of years ago, I commissioned Dr Kylie Bradfield and Professor Mark Priestley to summarise the evidence for and against kindergarten and raising the primary school starting age. The arguments for the status quo, the very early school starting age that we have here in the UK, were rarely based on educational benefits. The, the two primary benefits that are usually cited for what we currently have are, firstly, child protection, that for many vulnerable children, school is the safest place for them to be, but of course, kindergarten would be an equally safe place to be. And the second is an economic argument, that children who start school earlier generally enter the workforce earlier and therefore work for longer before they retire. But I think that's a bit of a soulless argument, because of course we are more than just units of labour. There is clear evidence of better educational attainment throughout a young person's time at school when they start at that later age. And in fact, the Dattar 2006 study found a bigger benefit, long-term educational attainment benefit, for vulnerable and at-risk children who started later rather than earlier. But one other significant advantage, I think, is in the mental health benefits that a number of studies have found by the time a young person has reached their late teens, if they started formal schooling at a later rather than at a younger age and had the benefits of that kindergarten experience first. And I think much of that comes back to the quite, pretty simple concept of joy. Children should enjoy learning. They should enjoy their time at nursery, at kindergarten, at school. And play-based learning at a kindergarten stage means that for many children, their first experience of education is a joyful one, not the jarring one that a number of us will have uh, experienced as we moved from nursery into a more formal primary school setting. So that's why the Scottish Greens Manifesto proposes that three to six kindergarten stage. We want children to be happy, to, to enjoy learning, and we want education policy to be evidence-based. And I agree absolutely with the point that Ros McCall made, that we need to look globally at the evidence base for this, because there is a really substantial evidence base out there. In closing, I do want to pay credit, as uh, Martin Whitfield has just mentioned, to the teachers and schools who are already delivering play-based learning, particularly in primary one, but in many cases up to primary three. Practice has already shifted in our schools, but our system is holding us back from fully realising the benefits of that. So I would urge the Scottish Government to take this conversation forward with experts, with the unions who represent teachers and our early year staff, with councils and, of course, with parents and carers. Much like exam reform at the other end of the formal uh, school experience, it is time, I believe, to leave behind the Victorian era constraints that we still have on our education system, to move to a kindergarten stage and to give children that joyful first experience of education that they deserve. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gray. And could I say to our, our, our guests in the gallery that you obviously are very welcome to be here, and I'm glad that you made it for part of the debate, but we don't invite the gallery members to clap in our proceedings. But I'm sure that now that you know that, uh, you will be uh, heeded to do so. Um, and I lastly call, before I call the Minister, Megan Gallagher. Ms Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I wasn't intending necessarily to say anything in today's debate, but I think the debate itself has been so thought-provoking in terms of members' contributions. And I am a stickler for talking about improving the lives of children and young people at every given opportunity. Uh, this week, uh, my inbox, I read a fascinating manifesto pledge by a campaign group called 2020 Together, and it was called oh, It's All About the Children. They had a launch uh, last week. Unfortunately, I was unable to attend due to other commitments, but I think it really hits home how important early years is in particular to a child's development. Back in 2016, um, of course, the Scottish Government made a promise to provide 1140 hours of free childcare um, to children from the ages of three to five. And of course, that's exactly the, the age range that we are speaking about today in terms of how we look at advancing uh, ch uh, the learning experience of children and young
young people from that really early age. But I think we do need to look at what we've got just now before building on what we can do in the future, because we need those structures in place in order to make it work. And that was something that Fulton McGregor um, touched upon during his contribution in terms that the early years offering that we have just now would need to be re-looked at should we uh, embark on this huge challenge. But I think it is a challenge that's worth embarking on. If I can just pick up on the, the manifesto pledge itself, presiding officer, because I think there was um, really important elements of the, the, the manifesto, and you know I would uh, appreciate if not, maybe not for today, um, but certainly at some point in the future, if the minister and I could have discussions um, on this, because it's from uh, a group that's in my region. Um, they've been active campaigners, but it's also people who want to make sure that the experience for children right at the early stages of their lives is as best as it possibly can be. Because I think the early years offering that we have just now has been positive for local authorities, but it certainly has not been as positive for the, the private, voluntary and independent sector. Um, you've got the private, voluntary, independent nurseries providing the same level of care for children with staff who have the same qualifications uh, as, as they would in local authority settings. But when you actually look at the pay disparity between the two, it is very stark. So the living wage for someone in a private, voluntary, independent nursery is around £12 an hour. But if you contrast that with the, the salary of someone within the early years setting for local authority jobs, that's roughly sitting about £16. So you can see the disparity in terms of those who are trying to give our young people the best possible start in life. So that puts us on an unequal footing even before we begin to look at how childcare and how early years would redevelop under uh, the, the debate uh, that we're talking about today in relation to a kindergarten stage, in relation to learn through play, which is so vital actually when you're looking at a child's development. And I know that for myself uh, when I uh, look at my toddler, who is going to be two next month, she challenges me every single day uh, to learn through play. And I have thoroughly enjoyed that experience with her as well. So I think when we're looking at this as a whole, we also need to look at what we're offering just now. We we need to get those structures and pillars in place. We need to sort out the fundamental problems. And then I think that's the right opportunity to then look at how we can improve, develop, create something new for Scotland to give those children the best possible start in life. So I challenge the Minister um, to, to look at what we've got just now, fix the problems with 1140. So when we do look at this kindergarten stage, we're starting from the best possible place because that will benefit our children uh, as best as it could do. Um, and that's, I think, the most important thing that we can do as parliamentarians. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Gallagher. And I now call on Minister Natalie Don to respond to the debate. Up to seven minutes, please, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Now, I am very thankful to Fulton McGregor for bringing this debate to the Chamber, and I truly welcome the many excellent contributions from members this afternoon, informed by research and evidence from Upstart Scotland. I wholeheartedly agree on the importance of giving our children the best possible start in life, and I strongly support this kind of opportunity to foster an open dialogue about the best way to achieve that over the longer term. Now, I note the points that many colleagues have raised around the international evidence on the benefits of play-based early years education, the benefits of active social play, Scotland's school starting age when compared with other European countries and that the school starting age has not changed since the 19th century, and how a universal play-based kindergarten stage with a raised formal school starting age could contribute to closing the attainment gap. And these are very important considerations which I do take seriously and I'm very interested in exploring further. I absolutely recognise the critical importance of children's early years experiences to their life outcomes, particularly when they are growing up in disadvantaged circumstances. Now, I'm aware that since the pandemic, there has been an increase in the proportion of children who are not meeting their developmental milestones and that there are persistent inequalities between, between children living in the most and the least deprived areas. So I think this debate is really timely and important. Now, you might not hear me say this often, but I actually wholeheartedly agree with Megan Gallagher about some of what she says in terms of we do need to look at what is happening right now. And there have been some huge achievements. So I would like to talk to some of them. 
Since 2014, we have undertaken one of the most significant reforms to public services in a generation. We have almost doubled the entitlement to high quality funded ELC from 600 to 1140 hours per year for all el eligible children. And we know that provision of high quality ELC makes such an important contribution to children's outcomes, particularly, as I have said, when they are growing up in disadvantaged circumstances. There has been near universal uptake of the offer of funded ELC among three and four year olds. And in Independent research has shown that 97 per cent of parents are satisfied with the quality of funded ELC, and we should not underestimate what an achievement that is. However, and I have said in the Parliament before, I do not shy away from some of the concerns, specifically in relation to rates. I have discussed this with many members before. I continue to discuss this with the stakeholders. 2020 together, for example, and the member is aware of, um, of the ongoing work in relation to the rates review. I am happy to discuss this further with the member. I do not necessarily feel this debate is the right place for that, because I have got a lot that I would like to get through. Another important achievement I think we really need to highlight, and it has been done by other members this afternoon, um, is the, the, school, the age to defer school entry. Um, and Mr McGregor rightly mentioned the tireless efforts of the Give Them Time cam campaign. As a result, since August 23, all children who defer their school entry are automatically entitled to that additional year of funded ELC. And I know that members agree that this is a very important step forward in supporting parents to make these critical decisions in the best interests of their child, without that worry of additional costs. Now, I am a huge advocate of the approach we have in Scotland to promoting play-based, child-centred and outdoor learning in the early years. And this is critical to supporting children to recover from the impact of the pandemic, including in respect of their early language development, which is an area of children's development that has been particularly affected. And I always like to bring my, my personal experiences witnessing excellent practice in person. And on my recent visit to Little Bugs Outdoor Nursery in Dunfermline, I saw how outdoor learning and play benefits children in respect of their physical health and mental, social and emotional well-being. And children in ELC currently spend on average 39 per cent of their time outdoors, so we are making very good progress with this. This kind of excellent pra practice can also be delivered in the early years of primary school because of the flexibility of Scotland's curriculum for excellence, including the early level, which deliberately spans from age three until the end of primary one. And our internationally recognised practice guidance, realising the ambition being me, is driving forward efforts to support child-centred play and ensure continuity and progression in learning as children begin their primary school education. Now, Martin Whitfield spoke about UNCRC and the, the need for child's education to be tailored to that child. And realising the ambition being me is wholly focused on that. Indeed, I know Upstart Scotland have said, if this document can be translated into practice, in all Scottish early years settings, including primary one, Scotland's ELC provision will be up there with the Nordic countries. So I think it's imperative that we continue in our current efforts on ensuring that realising the ambition is effectively and consistently implemented both in early learning and childcare and in the early years of primary. As Fulton McGregor stated, there has been some excellent progress in recent years, and I saw this firsthand when I visited Roslyn Primary School last year, a visit that I know I've, I think I've probably spoken of previously in this chamber. But I know that we still have some way to go to ensuring that that play pedagogy is fully embedded at the early level. Now, to bring some of this together, I am really keen that we understand fully the impact of realising the ambition implementation, our transformational investment in ELC and deferrals policy, which could help to inform any further major reforms. Now, the final report on the evaluation of the expansion of funded ELC to 1140 hours is due to be published by the end of 2025. It is important also to highlight that an ambitious programme of education and skills reform is currently underway to improve outcomes for people who experience and deliver education in Scotland. Now, members today have referred to Upstart Scotland's evidence which shows that countries with a later school starting age perform better than those where formal education starts earlier. And I am therefore open to exploring options for what a kindergarten stage would entail, building on that progress that has been made to date and the evaluation of our early years policies. And in respect of the specific points made around PISA. I am very interested in considering the data around that in further detail alongside wider evidence. Now, 
We cannot shy away from the fact that introducing a kindergarten stage would be a fundamental change to our education system. And I believe all members touched on some of the things that would need to be considered. It would require significant further work to take stock of the evidence, understand the views of families, as Bob Doris rightly pointed out, and of course children, and consider carefully both the costs involved and the implications for our workforce. However, I want to be clear with members. I have listened very, very carefully to the views expressed in this debate, and I would be open to discussing the best approach to this with members across this chamber and the kinds of things that would need to be considered, as I have stated here before. I again want to thank those who have contributed to the important discussions today. I share your vision for early years education based on relationship-centred, child-led, play-based environments with a greater focus on outdoor learning. And I really look forward to working with colleagues from across the Chamber and with organisations such as Upstart Scotland to make this a reality for all of Scotland's children. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate. I suspend this meeting until 2pm. Thank you.